I welcome everyone to the 28th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, of apologies from Neil Finlay and Harrison Harris, who can't attend today. Um, so can I welcome in their place Neil Bibby and Bill Bowman. Before we move to the main item of business, uh, we've just got to decide on taking business in private, and it's proposed that we take items 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 in private. Uh, these are consideration of delegated powers provisions in bills and in legislative consent memorandums relating to UK bills. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Okay, uh, so we'll move on to uh, agenda item two, which is the formal stage two proceedings on the Prescription Scotland Bill. Can I welcome Ash Denham, uh, Minister for Community Safety and her officials. Morning, Ash. Good morning, Convener. Good morning, Committee. Okay. Um, for the purposes of Stage 2, members should have copies of the Bill as well as the marshalled list and groupings. The, the first uh, thing to decide is that Sections 1 and 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed on that? Okay. So we'll now move to section three of the bill, five-year prescription, exception for certain social security payments and tax credits, and I'll call amendment three in the name of Mark Griffin, grouped with amendment four. Mark to move amendment three uh, and speak to those amendments. Thank you, uh, Kimira. I move amendment three in my name. Um, Amendment 3 and 4 uh, lodged with the support of Citizens Advice Scotland seek to reduce the prescription period for reserved and DWP benefits to five years. Uh, that will bring the period into line with the five-year prescription period for the Scottish social security system. I move this Parliament back earlier this year to deliver greater dignity and respect in the Scottish social security system. Uh, my colleague Neil Finlay has similarly lodged amendments to reduce prescription period for council tax debts. Uh, Come here, these are no silver bullet, but I feel that they do go some way to make sure this Parliament is using its powers to bring fairness and to align with the principles the Law Commission set out regarding the five-year rule. Fundamentally, I want to raise concerns about the way uh, the DWP believe that it needs additional leeway to manage its recovery and simply why it does not have its house in order. And the issue was debated at length, as you'll know, at stage one consideration with uh, very clear contributions from Mike Daly and Mike Comyard that these periods should be and must be reduced to five years. And in their evidence, they put it to the committee that this is a simple matter of fairness, that why should a claimant only have just one month to challenge a DWP decision but be liable for court action for 20 years. And some of the points that the DWP have raised in their evidence, I think, also have to be challenged. Yeah, so, th so today I want to add some more detail to how th these amendments fit into, uh, th these amendments as a piece fit into a jigsaw recovery policy, as well as um, setting out some of the DWP practices operational today. Now, they said in their written evidence, and I'm quoting, recovery of DWP benefit debt will often take longer than five years to recover due to the possibility of higher priority debts, multiple debts, and the welfare considerations that limit recovery rates. And also that the application of the five-year prescription would reduce our ability to recover public money and could erode some of the safeguards we have in place to protect our customers from harsh or excessive recovery rates. Now, they appear to infer that the consequence of the five-year prescription period is recovery of multiple debts within a shorter window would uh, directly affect claimants who would be subject to more aggressive recovery procedures. But I want to, to first point out that these amendments and the bill um, relate to recovery typically through the courts, uh, an option that is costly, lengthy and infrequently used. The DWP does have other ways to, to recover its debts, uh, direct deductions from benefits, or if a person returns to work for some time, their state pension, as well as a bank and direct earnings, 
attachments. And these are powers that have no time limit, that are unaffected by this or the 1973 Act and are ultimately reserved. So again, these amendments are not a silver bullet, but it is an improvement within the scope of this bill and within the scope of our powers within the Parliament. And I'm sure the committee is already aware, but other, under current DWP uh, rules, recovery processes are not as virtuous as the DWP evidence suggests. Um, under universal credit, the, the recovery rate can be as much as 40 per cent. And we know that because um, advances have had to be requested, 20,000 in my region since full service rollout, that many are suffering um, from such an excessive recovery rate. Secondly, by its nature, UC rolls together multiple benefits into one payment so that when deductions are made to UC, multiple benefits are recovered uh, at once. And yep, well, I would agree with uh, DWP evidence that distinction for legacy benefits um, is, is clearer, but soon all in-work benefits will be rolled together. So recovery will be rolled together too as soon as universal credit is, is fully rolled out. So I, I disagree with their argument that it makes it harder to, to recover um, multiple debts from multiple sources of benefits when uh, eventually they will all be rolled into one in-work um, benefit. But finally, can we not on the DWP? He claims that the shorter win window would uh, require excessive recover recovery appears to be one based on misunderstanding. We know that the DWP would prefer recovery through its reserved powers, not through a costly court decree or document of debt. And, however, if it did exercise its right under the proposed amendment, it would take if it would have five years to take action. And I'm advised by Mike Holmyard that should they secure a repayment on record um, through the reserve powers that they will have unchanged by any of the amendments here, that that five-year clock would restart. Every single payment they received, that five-year clock would reset. Every time they sent a letter or started enforcement action, that five-year clock would reset. So it's not a hard um, five-year limit on the the time they have to recover that debt. It's a five-year limit for them to take action, to start the process, or to take a single payment. And I hope that committee would agree with me that if the DWP is not able to identify and begin recovery of its debt within five years, then should we not ask them to get their house in order and start to um, set out processes that make that achievable rather than leave a 20-year um, period hanging over someone's head. And as I've said, um, because the clock restarts um, when payment is made, um, it's, a, in the, it's the provisions under this bill at section 6, which ultimately will limit recovery to a hard um, 20 years. Now, can we these amendments cancel the existing rule in the 1973 Act, which says Reserved social security debts can be pursued for 20 years and change that rule to five years. That, I think, is far more reasonable than 20 years. And crucially, it's in line with the position of this parliament in relation to our own social security act. They would not prevent the DWP using its reserved powers to make deductions from reserved benefits because the power to do that lies in reserved law. The DWP's right to pursue the debt through other civil mechanisms through an earnings attachments or direct deductions are preserved. It would align the powers of recovery in practical and operational terms um, because it would establish a near consistency with the six-year limitation rule in England, not to mention, I think, a, a far better administrative process. And finally, before I, I finish, convener, I want to make clear that these amendments do not proposed to remove child support or maintenance debt from the 20-year rule. And these are not social security paid by the state, although the DWP does administer it. Uh, the maintenance is recovered by DWP from the absent or non-resident parent and is provided to the parent with care. And I think retaining the power to recover that vital support until the, ad, uh, the, the child is an adult is something we should all seek to preserve. We do, though, have a chance to use Scottish powers of prescription 
not to impede the DWP's work uh, to protect the public purse, nor to make a constitutional point, but instead to deliver greater dignity and respect. Um, and convener, I hope the uh, committee will support these amendments today and I move Amendment 3 and ask committee members to also support Amendment 4 in my name. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, any other members want to come in at that point? Mr Arthur. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Mr Griffin, and welcome to the committee. Just, just seek to clarify one or two points. So if you can just ask, um, you made reference to support from Student Citizens Advice Scotland. Can I ask what direct engagement you have had with the DWP in composing these amendments? No direct um, contact with DWP other than reviewing the evidence that they've made to the committee. Okay. And you would also recognise that this Parliament has no jurisdiction over the DWP, while it may be desirable for many members in here for the DWP to get its house in order, as you described it. We have no means of making that a reality as, as functions of the DWP are reserved to Westminster. Well, well the functions are reserved clearly. <coughs> if we impose a five-year prescription, then mm -hmm. I would hope that that would mean the DWP would get uh -huh. their house in order and uh, collect those debts within a five-year period rather than uh -huh. leaving those spinning on for, for 20. So there is a practical step that we can take. So you would hope that it would incentivise the behavioural change within the DWP, but you concede that but that's not guaranteed. Well, if, if, if they didn't act, then they would lose that ability to collect um, debt beyond five years. OK. Um, you referred to the courts as being a last resort, um, and that would incentivise action within five... Well, the courts would be a last resort, so presumably that would incentivise court action within five years, whereas under 20-year prescription... Um, other methods could be explored and exhausted um, beyond five years prior to taking court action. Would you accept that as correct? No. Uh, the advice that I've been given from um, external, external advisers who have given advice to this committee as well is that as soon as any payment is made, as soon as any effort is made to recover the debt, that, that five-year um, period starts again. And there's a hard limit on 20 years, so effectively the DWP could um, leave debt uncollected through this process until four years and 11 months, start again and have another five-year rollover period, start again at four years, 11 months, and do that um, four times up until the point where the hard limit of 20 years is met. So any time they took a payment, any time they sent a letter to someone who was in um, any debt to the DWP, that this five-year limit would reset and start again. You've stated, and I mentioned this again, about desiring the DWP to get their house in order, as you put it. Um, presumably, if you wish to see an expedited process, this would require additional resources to be applied to the pursuance of debt. Would you concede that point? Well, I, there are so few debts pursued in this way mm -hmm. through legal action that the vast, vast, vast majority of debts are pursued um, through uh, reducing mm -hmm. the benefits that people currently receive or an earnings deduction, that I can't see that's been uh, having a, a, a massive impact and uh, a need for greater expenditures from the DWP. But setting aside the scale, the corollary of your argument is that there would have to be an expedited process. That's what you would define as a DWP getting their house in order. Ergo, for this to be an expedited process, there would have to be some additional resources. Surely that's logical. Yep, and I would accept that it there would be, uh, as far as I would see, would be minimal, but would be um, agreeable to those extra resources if it removed a 20-year um, sentence over someone's head that the DWP were able to um, only have five years to carry that out rather than um, having 20 years to pursue someone when an individual themselves only has one month to go back to the DWP to, to pursue a wrongdoing on DWPs. OK, but as long as we're clear, we accept that uh, this could actually lead to the DWP prioritising resources for pursuance of debt. Sorry, um, I'm just going to cut in here. Um, I think we'll, <coughs> we need to make this more of a debate rather than uh, a cross-examination of Mr Griffin. So I think, Mr Arthur, if you've got any um, sort of substantive points you want to make? No, I'll just conclude. I do thank Mr Griffin for taking these questions. I, I, I certainly um, 
sympathise with what, um, a we what is, I think, a well-intentioned amendment. However, my concerns are the unintended consequences that could lead from this, um, such as the DWP have highlighted in their memorandum to the committee earlier this year. Um, and I would conclude by saying this is a, a fairly short piece of legislation with a clear purpose, which is to clarify the law of prescription. Um, and I think before looking at issues of reserve benefits, that would merit far greater consideration and consultation. Um, and as such, I'll be unable to support the amendment. Okay. Any other members want to come in? Um, thank you, Mr Griffin, for taking the questions. You'll, you'll have a chance to come back um, afterwards. Can I call the minister to say something? Thank you, convener. And I'd just like to s begin by addressing Amendment 3. And if it's Mark Griffin's intention to remove the exceptions for obligations to repay reserve benefit overpayments from Section 3 of the Bill, then I would point out that Amendment 3 is unnecessary. Amendment 4 will achieve this effect because the exception would be removed from the Bill and the obligations would therefore fall to be caught by the new general rule. Reserve benefit overpayments do not explicitly need to be listed in Paragraph 1 of Section Schedule 1 of the 1973 Act, as Amendment 3 would do. Um, turning to the intent of Mark Griffin's amendments, Section 3 of the Bill provides that all statutory obligations to make payments will prescribe after five years, with a few exceptions. And one of those exceptions are obligations to repay overpayments of certain reserved benefits, including Social Security and tax credit overpayments. This exception preserves the status quo for these reserved benefits. In their response to the Scottish Law Commission consultation, the DWP made the point that recovery of Social Security overpayments often takes place over long periods of time, and they would be concerned were the five-year prescription period to apply rather than the 20-year prescription period. And this point was also made to the committee at stage one, the DWP's view is that having a 20-year prescription period for recovery of reserved benefit overpayments allows them to protect the most disadvantaged in our society from harsh recovery methods. I'd like to finish my statement and I will at the end. As an indication of the scale, DWP have, over the last few years, recovered an average of around £120 million per annum from debts that are over five years old. In their evidence to the committee, the DWP have been clear that making recovery of reserved benefit overpayments subject to the five-year prescription would impose greater hardship on the most vulnerable members of our society. They have informed the committee that they have a public duty to protect public funds and to collect arrears. It seems clear that changing the prescription period by reducing it would result in the DWP taking more money more quickly from those who would least likely to be able to afford it. Any move to a five-year prescription period would impact their ability to recover debts where recovery rates have been reduced on account of hardship or where the customer has a number of debts and recovery of later debts is on hold whilst the earlier debt is recovered. Ultimately, the DWP's policy in respect of reserved social security payments is a matter for them. And this bill is about prescription generally. It's not the place to make any substantial policy changes in other specific areas. And for these reasons, I would urge Mark Griffin not to press his amendments. Uh, Mr Griffin, you indicated you had a, a, a question for the Minister. I'll allow a question, um, but obviously you then get a chance to wind up. OK, thanks, Premier. Uh, thanks, Minister, for taking that intervention at the end of your statement. It was simply to ask you, repeatedly talked about the DWP's view as to why five-year prescription was not appropriate and the impact that that could have on mm -hmm. um, claimants in debt. But what is the Scottish Government's view? Why did the Scottish Government feel that it's appropriate to have five-year prescription for Scottish Social Security debts and then, on the other hand, agree with the DWP that five-year prescription is not appropriate? Well, the Scottish Government's position is that we've accepted the view of the Scottish Law Commission on this matter, that we believe that this is a matter for the DWP, it's a matter for them, and that more widely, this bill is a bill about prescription to improve, improve clarity. So it's not the place for this type of um, change, I guess, that would be more far-reaching. I have much sympathy with uh, the members' um, intention behind the amendments, 
but I don't think at this stage it would be something that is appropriate to you know, change th things in this way without appropriate consultation, because this would be quite far-reaching. And with regard to the Scottish Social Security, obviously that is the benefit of devolution, that we can, um, you know, Scottish ministers can decide to make changes or to make a system that is completely different to the one in the UK, um, and the one that fits the Scottish context, and that's why the two things are different. Minister, um, can I invite Mark Griffin to wind up and press or withdraw? Thanks, Camilla. Given the Minister's comments on Amendment 3 and the necessity for that, I'm happy to go away um, and look at that ahead of um, Stage 3. I think the Minister has relied um, or over relied on uh, DWP evidence when it comes to this issue rather than taking the principles at the heart of this Scottish Government's policy on dignity and respect. Um, and um, she did mention that that is one of the beauties of uh, the devolved system, that we're able to take different decisions. Well, that actually applies also to the prescription bill, that we're able to take different decisions on prescription too, but I'm happy to um, seek committee's permission to withdraw Amendment 3 and not press Amendment 4. OK. Are the members happy with that? OK. Thank you, Mr Griffin. Um, we then move on to the next one, which is five-year prescription exception for council tax. And I'll call Amendment 5, which is in the name of Neil Findlay, grouped with Amendments 6 and 7. Uh, I believe uh, Neil Bibby is uh, poised to move Amendment 5 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Um, I will uh, move Amendment 5 and speak to Amendment 6 and 7 in the group as well. Um, it's important to say, first of all, it's not Neil Finlay or uh, my intention to reduce the amount of money that councils have access to. We would continue to argue for sustainable and meaningful solutions to the chronic underfunding of Scotland's local authorities. Although I have not uh, heard the evidence directly, the evidence uh, that I have seen from removing the exemption of council tax from the five-year prescription rule is uh, compelling, and the removal of the exemption has been supported by many stakeholders. Uh, I know committee members will be aware of that. There are a number of reasons that the Law Society have given for why the current exemption in the bill is problematic. Non-payment of council tax attracts a high uh, penalty charge, around 6 per cent. This could, in fact, act as a disincentive on the collecting council as the returns from the penalty will rise above inflation, and therefore the effective value grows on non-payment. Practitioners identified potential situations where people might, in good faith, believe they, they had paid the council tax. This is further compounded by the joint liability for council tax, which means that a person could have paid their share of council tax but face a claim for payment again with significant interest because a joint tenant has not paid his or hers. It could prove uh, prejudicial to the interests of justice to incur such high penalties many years later if no steps to collect the tax or enforce an order have been taken in the interim. In many cases, it might be expected that uncollected sums are quite small, and if the council has not sought to enforce within five years, there may be little practical appetite to pursue them many years later. At this committee, Mike Homeyard from Citizens Advice Scotland also told the committee that the position was unfair, citing problems with obtaining sufficient and adequate evidence from both the debtor and the local authority collection systems. He explained the way in which council tax is collected exacerbates the difficulties debtors have in understanding their council tax debt and that citizen vice advisers see clients who have built up council tax debts over 10, 11 or 12 years, apparently without the council having taken any previous action to collect those debts. The clients cannot understand how the council apparently goes from inaction to drastic action that will have an impact on any property that they own. A five-year prescriptive period would force all creditors actively to try and enforce their debt which would perhaps put off the need for things such as sequestration by councils. There is a wider point to be made about the cost of living and the affordability of council tax debt charity step changes recent report uh, Scotland in the Red 2017. Uh, increasingly, clients are in debt because they are falling behind on essential bills. In particular, council tax is a growing problem. Among those who contacted step change in Scotland, 41 per cent were in council tax arrears, up from 37 per cent in 2013. 
The amount of council tax arrears owed also increased drastically by 45% from 1,368 in 200, uh, 2013 to 1,981 in 2017, making council tax arrears a much larger proportion of average debt. Um, as members will know, my party has called on the Scottish Government to scrap and replace the council tax, as it promised to do in 2007. Until then, we need, obviously need a wider debate about the meaningful reform of local government and tax uh, raising powers. Um, I move the am amendment uh, five, and I will seek to answer any questions the members have in closing. Thank you, Mr Bibby. Um, any members? Yes. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning to Mr. Bibby. But just a few points I'll, I'll pick up on. I'm not getting any specific questions, but just some areas I want to highlight. Um, in Mr. Bibby's remarks, he spoke about um, councils being um, incentivised to delay re um, seeking repayment um, due to the accruement of interest. It's interesting to note that in, in causal submission, they highlight the potential for a behavioural change um, if we move to a five-year period of prescription, uh, which they argue would incentivise um, individuals to uh, seek to get beyond that five-year um, period uh, so that we were no longer liable for taxes. Another point at Cosler raised, which I think is actually very significant um, with regards to the, the autonomy and status of local government, is that this would remove a parity that exists between taxes owed to the Crown and taxes owed to local government. Um, Two more practical concerns I have, though, is that, and again, this is analogous to, to the issues um, raised by Mr Griffin's amendment, are that additional resources may or would presumably be required um, to expedite this process of collecting debt. And again, uh, Mr Bibby alluded to the financial circumstances of local government, and this is again an issue raised um, in submissions from local government, that this would require additional resources to expedite a process, and these resources could be better spent elsewhere. And the final point I'll make again is just with reference in the context of this bill, this is a short uh, bill with a very specific purpose to clarify the law of prescription. I think that we, um, through a uh, stage one and in our inquiries this committee has um, explored a range of areas um, and a range of interest that this uh, bill has provoked um, but what has become very clear is that while areas such as council tax and a DWP um, do merit further consideration this bill is not the place to do it um, and I would suggest to um, to members who have an interest in these areas is to consult and to explore further and to bring forward more substantive proposals which have actually been um, constructed following substantive consultation and engagement and not seeking simply to piggyback on this legislation which is, this legislation is not designed for. Thank you Mr Arthur. Um, Minister. I'd like to directly address Amendment 5, and I'd make the same point uh, to Mr Bibby, Neil Finlay, um, that I made to Mark Griffin on his. If the intention is to remove the exception for the obligation to pay council tax from Section 3, then Amendment 5 is unnecessary, as Amendment 6 alone will achieve this effect, and for the same reasons. This bill does not seek to change the position of council tax, and its aim is simply to maintain the status quo as we understand it. Local taxes form a substantial source of income for local authorities, paying for essential services like education, housing, roads and so on. The Scottish Government accepts the considered view of the Scottish Law Commission on this matter. At stage one, COSLA told the committee how a 20-year prescription period for recovery of arrears allows local authorities to quickly begin the recovery process at minimal cost to taxpayers all the while protecting those who owe arrears by entering into long-term arrangements. All of this would be jeopardised by changing and shortening the prescription period. Uh, I note that the committee have written to all 32 local authorities seeking further information on this point and received responses from 26 of them. And it's important to note that not one of those agreed that changing the prescription period was appropriate. Instead, they are all adamant that no change to the status quo should be made. Among the points made by local authorities were that the policy reasons which justify accepting taxes payable to the Crown from the five-year prescription apply equally to taxes payable to local authorities. That is, there should be no distinction between taxes owed to central government and those owed to local authorities. Highland Council said, and I quote, it would place local authorities at a disadvantage to HMRC and ordinary creditors. It's inconceivable 
to believe that this is actually what is at stake. Closed quotation. Local authorities continue to recover a significant amount of arrears each year. More than two billion worth of council tax debt is currently owed across Scotland, and £1.2 billion of this relates to debts that are more than five years old. And this is money that obviously would be spent on local services. Making the prescription period for these debts five years would likely force a change in the way councils recover this debt, to the detriment not only of the debtor, but to all of us who use local services. Local authorities have told the committee that they would have to depart from the summary warrant process, meaning more costs for the debtor and a diverting of local authority resources to collection of arrears. The 26 local authorities that have responded to the committee are all deeply concerned about the impact of any change to the prescription period by shortening it from 20 years to five years and the effect that that would have on their funding. Not only are they concerned about the ability to recover arrears, that are already owed to them, but they're also concerned that reducing the prescription period may create an incentive to those who wish to avoid paying their taxes in the first place. If council tax is subject to the five-year prescription period, it is all taxpayers who will suffer as a result as they'll have to pay an increased amount of council tax in order just to maintain the current level of services. Finally, this bill is about prescription generally, the point that I made about the earlier set of amendments, and it's not the place, therefore, to make substantial policy changes in other specific areas. And any change to the current position would need wider consultation, particularly in light of the views expressed by so many local authorities, by COSLA and other issues, um, such as ones raised by Scottish Water, um, that were brought up earlier in the stages to the committee. And because of this, I would urge um, Neil Finlay, represented by uh, Mr Bibby, not to press these amendments. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Neil B Bibby to wind up and press or withdraw. Thank you, Convener. I think we've, we've gone over a lot of the same arguments from the, from the previous groups. Um, I would just repeat that um, these amendments have been developed from the evidence that we've seen from the, the Law Society and the Citizens Advice Scotland, except... Um, what Tom Arthur said about there being concerns from, from COSLA and we will continue to aim to address uh, those. There may be small additional resources required, um, but I do not accept they uh, would be substantial. I agree with COSLA and, and Tom Arthur that Council's are, resources are limited. In fact, they are chronically underfunded and we will continue to make the case for that uh, to be addressed. Um, following the Minister's remarks, um, I will not move Amendment 5 on the basis of uh, what the Minister said about that not being necessary, but I will seek to move Amendments 6 and 7. So drawing that. Yeah. No object to that. Okay. Thank you. Um, an amendment for, uh, in the name of Mark Griffin, you've already said, Mr Griffin, you're not moving that. Okay. So, Amendment uh, 6, uh, Mr Bibby, you're moving that? Okay. So, the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. 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 Okay. Uh, we'll go to a vote on that. Um, so, all those uh, in favour of Amendment 6, could you raise your hands? And all those against Amendment 6. Uh, that was disagreed to. Um, amendment 7, Mr. Bibby, are you moving that one? Uh, move. Okay. So the question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. So. All those in favour of Amendment 7? Okay. And those against? Yeah, so it's 4 1 against. So it's disagreed to. Um, so the question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The next question is that sections four to six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. 
We now come on to technical and consequential amendments. So call amendment one in the name of the minister, group with amendment two. The minister to move amendment one and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Amendment one addresses the point raised by the Faculty of Advocates. The Faculty and others raised concerns about the Section 7 extension of the 20-year prescription period for some property rights, in particular servitude rights, as highlighted by the committee in their Stage 1 report. The Faculty made the point that the drafting of Section 7, as it stands, suggests that when a creditor raises court proceedings in relation to a property right before the expiry of the 20-year period, and the proceedings extend beyond the 20-year period, the period in relation to that right ends when the proceedings end, with the consequence that the property right is extinguished. This amendment is to ensure that where the creditor is successful in the court proceedings, for example, obtaining a declarator of the existence of the right, then the creditor should not be denied the property right by the 20-year prescription coming to an end at the end of the court proceedings. Instead, this amendment ensures that where the creditor's claim is successful, the property right is deemed to have been exercised or enforced. The outcome is that a new 20-year prescription period will start to run. Turning to Amendment 2, recent changes to the devolution settlement have given the Scottish Parliament legislative competence over a range of benefit payments. And the recent Social Security Scotland Act 2018 created a legislative framework that underpins a system of devolved benefits, creating a process in which people are given the assistance to which they're entitled. At the same time, the 2018 Act makes clear that those receiving devolved benefits are under an obligation to repay overpayments of those benefits in certain circumstances. That obligation is subject to the five-year prescription period, and that is achieved by Section 66, amending Schedule 1 of the 1973 Act. The bill being considered today inserts a general rule into Section 1 of the 1973 Act that all statutory obligations to make payments will be subject to the five-year prescription period, and this will cover the obligation contained in the 2018 Act that I've just described. One of the main purposes of this bill is to increase clarity and legal certainty in having two provisions in an already crowded Schedule 1 of the 1973 Act that achieve the same outcome does not achieve this aim. Um, and I move Amendment 1, Convener. Thank you. Any members want to make comments on that? Mr thank Arthur? You, thank you, Convener. Very briefly, the purpose of this bill is, of course, to bring uh, greater uh, clarity and these amendments contribute to that. So I, I welcome the Minister for bringing them forward. OK, thank you. Um, Minister, um, you can wind up if you wish. Nothing further to add, but I would thank the committee for their consideration and um, I would invite them hopefully to approve the amendments. Okay, thank you. So the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Right. The question is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Okay. And the question is that sections uh, 8 to 15 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to move formally? I move, Convener. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Agreed. Yes. And the question is that sections 16 and 17 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Agreed. Okay. Uh, the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. And that ends stage two consideration of the bill. Can I thank the minister and her officials for their attendance? And I'll briefly susp suspend the meeting. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, agenda item three, in instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on the draft Common Financial Tools Scotland Regulations 2018. Is the committee content with this instrument? Content. Okay. Agenda item four, uh, consideration of an instrument subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSI 2018-272. Is the committee content with this instrument? Okay. I'll move the meeting into private session. <laughs>